Agencies Drinking Beer is brought to you by Proposify, software that helps you deliver beautiful proposals in the cloud and close more deals. Hello and welcome to the 39th episode of Agencies Drinking Beer. On today's show, we're joined by Bill Wilson, who is the founder of MindSea, an app development firm based out of Halifax, Nova Scotia. And I'm going to be talking to Bill about how to view competition and why your process can be your competitive advantage. today. Um, Kevin is in Phoenix, Arizona right now. Actually, he took a little excursion with his family. I believe he is at the Grand Canyon as we speak. Um, He just sent me a text of a giant gorge, which I'm going to assume is the Grand Canyon. Um, So he's enjoying his time down there. He's uh, part of the ICON conference, so the Infusionsoft conference. He's down there for that. I think he's going to be sitting in on a panel. Um, you might recall last week I was actually out because uh, I was sick. I had uh, bronchitis. You can probably still hear it in my voice. Jen and Kevin uh, took over the episode and they made fun of me. They said that uh, it was a better episode because I wasn't there. Um, I fired Jen, uh, Kevin. I'm you know we're parting ways now. Uh, of course not really. Um, I, ha- I have a thick a thick hide I think by this point. Um, so anyway, I ended up uh, getting in touch with uh, my friend Bill Wilson, who is a local agency owner here in Halifax, and he was willing to come on the podcast um, and talk about, he's, he's, a, he's a good talk and shop kind of guy. Um, it's very easy to get lost in conversation with him. So uh, I don't really have an intro for this week, but uh, we had a fantastic interview with Bill. Um, it's just him and I, and you'll see Jen pops in for a minute there to... Um, try to water down our drinks um so listen out for that and uh, other than that well, let's just get into the interview with bill wilson so welcome bill thanks man we have bill wilson on the podcast today um bill joins us from halifax nova scotia local Local agency owner who runs uh, the best, uh, I've heard the best, iOS app development shop in the world. Is that correct? Uh, sure, I'll take it. <laughs> Thanks, man. So why don't you give the listeners a little a little background on MindC, what, sure. how it started and what you guys are up to. So MindC started off as a sort of loose gathering of other like-minded developers that wanted to go off to work together. Uh, I quickly realized without anybody really kind of steering that ship, it wasn't going to go anywhere. So I decided to start hiring people, I guess. Like I wanted to start building something more. Um, And at that time, mobile was really coming on strong. I had done a lot of mobile work um, in jobs past. Hmm. Uh, This was around the time the iPhone got released, right? Yeah, 2000. So it was probably 2009 when I started going down there. And... um, so the, yeah. kind of the app marketplace was a new just thing. Just starting. And, yeah, yeah, just starting. And I really wanted to do it. Mm. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I guess that's sort of how we got started. And then, you know, fast forward a few years and a few more offices and a few more people. You know, we're now 15 people building, you know, mobile apps for people across North America. We focus on native, you know, apps for iOS and Android. Mm. Um, we build those for several different types of groups. But we do a lot of media companies. We do a lot of startups. Um, and we've done a lot of, um, I guess you'd call, uh, people who have existing offerings that want to enter sort of the mobile channel right. and build out their offering on mobile. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe an example of that would be like newspapers, right? Yep. When newspapers. They we do a lot of newspaper work. Um, you know, we do a lot of work for Post Media, the Chronicle Herald. We do a little bit for Dallas Morning News. You know, there's a few more. I guess I probably shouldn't really name drop. Sure, if you want. Actually, I'll name drop for you. Uh, anybody who is familiar with Transit 360. Oh, right. My, one of my favorite apps <laughs> now that I've started uh, taking the bus again. Nice. And so Transit 360, you guys are in how many cities? Uh, I've lost count. I think it's at least 40. What? Yeah. I didn't even know that. Yeah, and it's, all, it's Canadian only still. Yeah. So we're across Canada in as many municipalities we can get into. Hmm. We support real-time data now, which is something that we hadn't done for a long time. Um, 
So in any of the cities that support that, we can do that, which is really nice. So cool. Yeah, it's so great. So you just pull in their data, and it's it's basically a bus schedule. It's 100 times better than Yeah, I mean, the whole point of schedule. transit to go at the time is what it was called, it was to build something demonstrably better than uh, – what was available then, which is paper schedules and phone-in systems and... Those horrible little <clears throat> monitors at the bus stop. Yeah, that, yeah, so we wanted to build something that was demonstrably better than that. And mm-hmm. so what we did was, you know, use the sensors in the phone. So we used the GPS and the always-on data and, mm. you know, we got the open data through, uh, essentially, through the various municipalities that have opened it up to Google for the Google Transit maps. Mm. So we used the same format and we were able to, you know, you can launch it and say, what are the routes around me? And it shows you that all the buses that are going to run near you mm. and the next three times they're going to leave and where to catch them. Yeah. You know, like that's that was such a no brainer. Um, one thing that's always really impressed me about uh, you and, and MindSea is the fact that you guys don't do. We were talking earlier a little bit while we, we were waiting to get into our uh, the coveted recording room um, ab- about the idea of selling locally. So, you know, you kind of said, when you're in a small market like Halifax, and we've talked about this a lot on the show before, that unless you really have a good reason for selling to a client somewhere in some other city in North America or beyond, um, you kind of are stuck with a local market because why is anybody going to go to another, um, somewhere, to to an agency somewhere in another city unless they have a really unique skill set that they need? And so one thing that's always impressed me about you guys is that you are everywhere. You have clients all over the all over North America. You don't rely as much on the local market. You might do some local stuff. Um, but you also have like a very tight sales process for getting into those. You're not just kind of relying on word of mouth and referrals. Can you talk a little bit about how, like how do you go about getting, a, you know, a sizable app build project from some client you don't know in another city? How do you do that? Well, we've been... We've had, uh, you know, on our website, we've used, I guess, a lot of inbound techniques without going, you know, whole hog uh, with some things for several years. So since 2010, uh, we worked with a fantastic guy, Tom McClellan, who really helped me understand how to sell and knew that I wasn't a salesperson and uh, embraced that. So we built, I think we did a webinar a lot like this. We drank some beers. Really? And then. (gasps) We forgot our gin. Yeah, well, it's all right. We're going to have to take a break. And get some gin. Get some gin. Yeah. So uh, we just had to we just had to pause for a minute and take a quick uh, quick little excursion into the fridge. Um, yeah, there you go. Um, one thing that I, I'm very ashamed of is that we don't drink on this podcast as much as we kind of say we do in the title. So Bill, uh, you saw to it that we we have some gin martinis in front of us. Yeah, you know, maybe a four ounce or maybe. I don't know. That's not very much. It's no, just a small a couple bottle. ounces. It's good. It's delicious. Ah, ooh. Ooh, it's strong. It is strong. Okay, that's good. Let's do this. That's good. So, <laughs> we're talking about sales process. Because I remember you've even told me before that you've used AdWords and you've used uh, maybe Facebook ads. You So, you actually have a, a process and a system to pull in leads, inbound leads, convert them into... Uh, you know, kind of opportunities, move them down the sales funnel. Like, you've got a very legit sales process. You're not just like, oh, I know some guy named Jim who moved out to L.A. and he needs an app. Oh. Yeah, no. I mean, as a developer... I, I don't wanna... know why I sound like I was from the 30s. No, that's but... fine. Uh, as a developer, though, I really wanted to systematize everything. Like, I just yeah. felt like we've got to be able to measure this stuff. Um, so it was early on. I had some help. Tom mm-hmm. McClellan really helped us out. Um, and we built Funnel essentially. So we had a sign up form on the website. We had a giveaway, which was a webinar of Tom and I talking about the state of apps in 2010. And we then, um, you know, we, and we built a website surrounding it, talked about the three pillars that we were trying to serve. Uh, At the time we were very focused on everybody's app problem because it was 2010 and apps were new and we were trying to figure out which vertical was going to make most sense for us. Mm -hmm. Um, so we were doing everything from marketing campaigns to extending mobile to, you know, any making money in the app store, you mm. know, any of those kinds of apps. So we put out, yeah, we did a Google AdWords campaign and the tip of the pyramid at that time for people who were actually searching the web for mobile app developers was pretty thick. Like it was the quality leads were there. Yeah. Um, so we were competing on those words, iPhone app development, that kind of stuff. It was kind of a gold rush really. I mean, yeah, it was good. And I mean, at the time I thought the ship had already sailed. I can remember having that conversation specifically with Tom. Like, I'm like, really? Like this is already done. Everybody's already figured this out. 
And looking back on that now, that sounds foolish, but I it, remember that's how like I felt. Headspace, my old agency, we kind of like dipped our toes in the water and we, our developer went away for a week and just read a book on uh, Objective-C or something and kind of learned how to build basic iPhone apps. So I think we did one or two projects. And of course we had it all over our website. We do iPhone apps. Yeah, no, you were like my big competition at the time. <laughs> I, rem- I, think I remember, three I projects. remember I was like, I don't want to talk to those Headspace guys. <laughs> We are dicks, but um, um, <laughs> but no, you went in full. Yeah, like, so we did that. Full, full yeah, like speed. we kicked off this campaign and uh, we landed our first couple of clients. I think in Missouri, believe it or not, Missouri. Yeah, Missouri. Wow. And uh, so we did mm-hmm. um, we did an app for this company in St. Louis, which was essentially a one man shop, who wanted to build an app um, that focused on his passion at the time, which was photo booths. And uh, so we built Pocket Booth, which was, uh, it turned out to be like a top 10 app. It was like, I don't know, app rewind, you know, when Apple does their feature things, at the end of the year, it was like 2012, one of the apps of the year or something. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of mind blowing for us. But yeah, that's how we built, like we built out the whole process. So it goes from, uh, you know, we would have the sign up form on the website, they would get an email shortly after that with the download links and an offer to have a call, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if they were interested, they would get in touch with us. We wouldn't do a drip campaign, we wouldn't do any of these things that, you know, people are doing now that are really effective. Mm. So we probably could have been more effective, but it seemed to work. So we did the initial email, um, they got the download, then we reach out to us, we could have a call, chat with them and just start the conversation. So it really opened up that, just that top of the funnel. And at the time, the leads were pretty decent. You know, we'd still get a bunch of people going, hey, I've got a website, now I need an app. And we're like, no, you don't really need an app. You, you know, apps are not websites. Which was the education piece for a long time. So I remember having several phone calls with lots of leads, um, talking to them about what their problem was that they were trying to solve. and oftentimes recommending they don't build an app. A lot of people at the time, and I probably still do, want to build an app because apps, they yeah. don't really have a strategy in place. Right. It's like you, you need an app. Yeah. I mean, more and more these days, I think people get it more yeah. and more, right? But unless you have something that, you know, you have a particular user group or, you know, people that you're trying to engage with in that channel and you need to be on that channel, don't build, like, don't build your, mm. don't turn your website into an app. It's not It's not what you do. And it's too expensive to do that. And I'm totally guilty of that line of thinking because for Proposify, I've wanted an an app forever, but I just can't find a business case for it. Right. Other than it's kind of cool to have. Right. I guess that that leads into something else. Like for us, part of that funnel isn't just the, um, the, you know, like you get them signed up and you have that conversation. We did do our own form of lead tracking Mm -hmm. and we used a weighted funnel right from the beginning. So... We assigned some arbitrary numbers, I think, at the time. Like, if a web lead came in, they get flagged as 3%. We built some software to take them. As soon as they signed up, we add them to a Trello board. Mm. And they get a card gets created for them. We used, I think, con- uh, full contact to go and try and grab as much information about them as we could based on what they gave us. Mm. So we could get a little bit more information about the like person. Industry <coughs> and Industry position. or, yeah, like even just their LinkedIn profile or, yeah. or something. Um, and then we would just await them, and then we'd move them through this set of call, set of lists in Trello and each one being more weighted than the other. And we would use that to figure out roughly how big our pipe was. Interesting use of Trello. I've never heard it mm-hmm. used that way before. Oh, yeah, it was great. And, wow. I mean, we did want to, like, we built some software to add the leads to it. Um, and I did want to build some software to actually do the calculations of the weighting. But uh, our funnel was small enough at the time. It was pretty easy to, do <laughs> to look at the ones that were 50% and, you know, divide that total in your head. Mm. Um so yeah, so we use that to sort of measure the size of our funnel. Um, but you know, those were early days. Um, but we've kept the same process yeah. o- over the last little while. We've improved the tools. Like we use a different CRM tool now that has a weighted pipeline built in, so I know exactly what the size of the funnel is at any time. Mm. Um, but really trying to generate content that people, you know, want to read, which is tough. Demonstrating and, your knowledge and expertise. well, yeah, just education, right? Like trying <clears throat> yeah. to talk about our space. Um, we have a lot of our staff are writing for the blog. Um, we do, so we're very heavy design focused shop and uh, development focused shop as well, but we have a lot of articles on design. Hmm. So uh, we get lots of designers. One got picked up a lot recently too, wasn't it? Yeah, we did. Uh, Amanda did a great one on um, the iPad Pro and the pencil. Right. And uh, she used it for a whole project, just doing all of her sketching during one of our blueprints. So she did all of her sketching with it, and then she, I think she did one more. And anyway, she wrote up her experience with it, and um, Gruber picked up on it and 
tweeted, or I think it was actually, it was the lead designer at Adobe, I think, tweeted about it. Mm. And that must be how he saw it. Anyway, it just sort of got picked up and we ended up getting, like we usually get um, a handful of leads every day coming through the through the pipe. Um, and on those days, it was like, you know, a couple of hundred. <laughs> and I remember you saying how it, it kind of, it's, it was great, like, exposure, but in terms of the lead quality, mm-hmm. it kind of went down because it was, like, competitors downloading your shit. Yeah, we would get a lot of emails saying, hey, thanks for the design checklist. You know, we're just trying to see how other people do what we do. Yeah. And You're like, fuck at, you. Well, at the time, I would, I, you know, if this was a few years ago, I would have been definitely, you know, feeling that way. Yeah. These days, I'm a bit more... You know, it's a really big ocean out there. There are lots of people doing great things. And if we can, like, I don't want to get all kumbaya and say if we can help each other, that's great. But the chances of us running into each other in a deal Mm. are pretty low. And that's one of those things. If you don't focus on your local market, you know, the the ocean's a lot bigger, right? If you don't want to run into your buddy who started his app design shop and his other friend who runs a marketing shop and your friend who runs a marketing shop, you know, like, it's just every, all these communities, no matter how big your city is, I think are really incestuous. Like there's just, they, everybody knows everybody and everybody knows everybody's business and that's something I didn't want to do. So that's a, a really, are you coming in, Jen? I'm Jen, just giving you Jen mix. just came in. I just realized you guys didn't have any mix and I was worried about you No, we don't need mix, it's true. We're it's making serious. martinis. Do you want to say hi to the listeners, Jen? Come, come I on. think I just did. Well, I'm th- just here on bar delivery. But uh, th- that's tasty. Uh, I, I was thinking they're drinking Virgin straight. Yeah. Yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's the way we roll. It's a proper martini. I'm and sure I, good. And coffee. I'm messing this up entirely. Oh, no, so you know. Bill's great. Bill's great. No, nope. it's a lot. Gin is a good idea lubricant, right? So yeah, yeah. I'm feeling I'm feeling good now. So you're not gonna s- sit in? No. I can't drink. You smell drink like chili. <laughs> no, Did you I, eat chili? I, I was eating <laughs> wasabi flavored oh. uh, pea snap pea crisps or whatever. Sorry. Those are really weird. See, I'm breathing all over you. I know. It's I'm being bathed in the air of wasabi. Grapefruit, uh, grapefruit Perrier. It's Thanks, fancy. Jen. Jen's trying to keep us from getting drunk. That's all she's doing. <laughs> Good luck. She's like, water that drink down, guys. I don't want to deal with you later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So back to this. So this is a nice segue, segue Bill. Not Jen just barging in with right, Perrier. Right. <clears throat> this, the nice segue was about this idea of competition. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's something I want to talk about. You know, you mentioned how when, when Headspace got into iPhone apps, you kind of felt, you know, there's that little... I think that... Agencies in the same city, especially small cities, kind of hate each other. Yeah, you might be friends. You might, you know, say, hey, how's it going? How's business or whatever at an event. But everybody's keeping their cards a little close to their chest. Nobody's being too forthcoming about their process, what's going on in a project, who's work. Like, there's sort of that unspoken rule when you're, like, with an agency owner in the same city that you just keep it very polite and high level, but you don't talk about your shit. I think that's my problem. I didn't know that rule. Really, <laughs> I remember. I'm pretty, I'm pretty into, open. You came into Headspace once to talk to us, but you you were a little bit, you know. Well, it's we funny. talked about romantic comedies for a bit, but yeah, we it didn't was talk fun. Rom coms, my favorite genre of movie, just in case anybody wants to know. Um, and your favorite rom com is Notting Hill. Oh, okay. I thought it was a different one. No, Notting Hill all the way. I Sorry, think, I know. I think we might have talked it's, about it's you the got worst. Mail. It's the worst. It's the worst movie and best movie of all time. Was it you got mail that you really liked though? Uh, no, it was okay. Okay. It was definitely Notting Hill. Right. I, I could recite. We could start it now. We've got a couple hours. I could recite it all. <laughs> no, we better not. Okay, that's good. Um, yeah, so I found, <coughs> yeah, like I guess in these small cities, this is, this is the big problem that around, you know, I think the term frenemy comes up a lot. And <laughs> this is interesting. I was if reading, you're 13. <laughs> well, no, but I was reading a thing about um, newspapers recently in the media companies and how basically the old guards getting replaced by, you know, Facebook and all these other great delivery tools for news, right? Mm. Most people are reading their news in other apps, not your, maybe not your newspaper app. Mm. And how do you, how do you try and solve some of those problems? And, you know, newspapers were, I think a lot like agencies that way. They were all kept their processes very close to a chest, mm. but now they're being forced to be very open with each other about how they do things. Um, so that they can all For the learn, best of the and industry. They can, yeah, so that yeah. they can all, you know, because their audiences are their audiences, right? Yeah. And sometimes you're competing for the same audience, but that's okay. Yeah. And I think that's what I've learned about the agency life too, is that this whole idea that, you know, uh, I think it was actually Carmen Peary from Cool Partners that yeah, said that Yeah, he's been on the once. show before. Yeah, he said uh, this idea about, you know, it's a big ocean, there's lots of sailboats, so you hardly see any, right? Like, yeah. and this is the thing, like we're, 
you know, we do, we want to do really great work. Until and, you're pitching against each other. And well, then and this is it. And this is why I really, like, at least in small cities, for us, like, we've tried not to be, like, we've tried not to do a ton of local work. Yeah. Do we do local work? Of course, because we're here and people hear about us, right? Mm. So we are, we do local work for sure. Um, and some of the best work we've done has been local work. And if it's a good client with a good budget, why would exactly, you turn it down? Right. So that's really what it's about. I think riding the coattails of, of other agencies or uh, government or any of these other things. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, they're just disastrous, right? Or they can be. I yeah. mean, maybe those relationships can work. I haven't. Uh, and, you know, I've got some great friends that run cool agencies and stuff. Mm. And we keep saying, oh, yeah, let's let's find something to work together on. And it never really quite happens. So partnerships. Yeah. Have you ever partnered with an agency? Yep. How did it go? Uh, uh, not well. No. No. You? Uh, same. I don't. I'm trying to think of when we did. I remember when, when I started Headspace, and it was very small. It was like me and Kevin. Um, we did a little bit of work for like a bigger ad agency, but we were kind of just actually Flash was still really big at the mm -hmm. time, and I'm like I used to be like an action script developer. I'm kind of oh cool, you know, not that you're a pro, <clears throat> happy or to an say. expert. I don't know which pro or expert. Well, I was pro because I was getting paid. Oh, okay. So. Well, there you go. Not an expert. Yeah, yeah. I ha like I'd hack shit together. Right. But, but anyway, yeah, we uh, we did a little bit of work for agencies, but we quickly saw that it wasn't a very um, long term profitable kind of thing. Yeah, the biggest problem I have with it is that. You know, I think the agencies are, are always focused on their client, mm -hmm. right? And if you're coming in providing a skill they don't have, I think they might feel, and I'm, maybe not for everybody, but they might feel a little bit, they don't want their client to know that they don't have that skill in-house and that they're yeah. going to use a third party. And I think our motto has always been, we will work with you if you're an agency if you bring us to the table. Like, don't hide us. I'm not going to, like, people have asked us to get an email address, Oh yeah, no problem. Yeah, you guys can. You guys do great work. Blah blah blah. Well, here, can you just sign up for an email address for our company? We'll get you an email address, and all the communication with the client needs to come through this. There's email nothing address. more sad and yeah, desperate it's, it's, than well, that. Well, it is right? pretty desperate, right? And I mean, and I feel I understand it because I, when I first started, I felt this way a little bit about, like I would work with freelancers, mm. and I'd want the freelancers to be have a mindset email address. Yeah. Right. Um, we possess that person. Well, this is it. We and own it's, them. And it's and it's this really um, insecurity about what you do. Yeah. And what I found is is that if we can if we can find partners that want to work with you and they understand the value you bring and they understand that that value you bring is actually a good thing for your client, for mm -hmm. their client. So if they bring you to the table, I, I, we've done a few engagements with a great agency in town, um, but they've been very, very small and mostly around just consulting and, and chatting. But they've been great because they've introduced us as the, you know, these guys do great stuff. We really like their work, mm -hmm. you know. Um, let's all talk about this problem together and we help solve it. The worst thing is trying to solve a problem through a proxy, hmm. right? So if the agency is being a proxy to the client yeah. and they're the ones who are articulating the, it's telephone. They're filtering yeah, what the client's It's a saying. telephone and, game. Yeah. So unless you're at the table, so my one piece of advice with that, if you're going to partner with agencies, be at the table. Yeah. Like don't be a hidden partner. I find one one kind of partnership you see a fair amount is uh, a design company that's very strictly design. They don't even pretend to code, but they know design. And then a development company that's like, you give us the design, we'll make it work. We'll, we'll you know, that, that kind of partnership kind of makes sense because yeah. they're complementary. But what I saw at Headspace is sometimes we would be the design partner for like a development company that's, that says, hey, we've got this client. It's like a hotel or something. We'll do all the coding, but we don't know design, so we need you guys for that. Mm -hmm. And that sounds great, but then you do the design, you do your mock-ups, and you present it, and the client buys it, and they're happy. And then the development company goes, okay, cool, we'll take that, and we'll work with that. And then they just launch it. Mm -hmm. And then you're just like, look at my design, and look at what we gave you. Yep. It's not the same. Not the same. Now we're telling people we designed this yep. piece of shit. Yep. And you didn't yeah, there's bring us in at all at the end to like vet it you know yeah if you need to pay the bills mm. it's some work you can do right yeah. that's some work you can do yeah and you're going to get paid but if you want to like it doesn't do much for you right maybe yeah. you get more work from that same development company mm. but if you're focused on trying to build that relationship with the client and you know help them understand you know the vision like you're trying to i guess in most agencies i think the, the goal they're coming to you with this problem and they're looking to you for a solution 
the fact that you guys do design is how you solve that problem. Mm -hmm. Fine. Um, but when they go to another company first, like a development agency, like this is why Mindsy is so design upfront. Like we do a lot of design work. We have a mm -hmm. lot of designers on staff. It's, you know, part of our thing. When we first started, we weren't, right? We were yeah. <laughs> like just developers. So we would rely on people. Like we used to work with Hi There. Do you remember oh, Hi There? Um, remember the name. Yeah, Nick Brunt and Ian Conrad. Great. Oh, oh yeah, Ian. Yeah, great guys. Duck, uh, yes, Porcelain, uh, Duck Porcelain Duck is his, on Twitter, uh, Twitter yeah. and Instagram handle. So I think he's in Toronto now. He reviews now. beers. Yes. He's a great beer reviewer. Right, anyway. right. Yeah, the yeah. Uh, consummate uh, hipster. Um, <laughs> and, a, and a mean ginger beard. <laughs> yes, that's right. So anyway, like we worked with those guys for the first few designs that we did. In fact, they did the first design for Transit to Go. Oh, did they? Yep, yeah. and they did a design for the first two apps we built, actually. And we worked with those guys, and that was really good because we would bring them to the table, and they would be part of the thing. It's like, yeah, this is high there. They're going to do the design. We're going to do the development. It was all transparent, and... Everything mm. was great. Sometimes you do things for the sake of the client, like one of us will do the billing, one of us will do the project management. Those types of things can work, but when you're a little guy and you're working for a big agency, you're basically just a freelancer for them. Yeah. If you're trying to build your agency and you've got staff that you have to feed and you know the rest of it, yeah. I, I would encourage people to get your own clients. Like yeah. It's just too hard to be constantly at the whim or the you know, one one mistake, right? Mm. And all of a sudden, the source of a lot of your deals could go away, Yeah. right? So if you're diversified, if you're building your own pipeline, if you're working on your own, uh, what do you call it? Your own... Uh, brand. Yeah, I don't wanna say brand, but you know, your own, I guess your own portfolio, you're, you're choosing which projects you work on based on what the clients are telling you. You know, your own business. You're, you're not business. building someone else's yeah, you're not business. Building, that's exactly it. You're not building someone else's business. Yeah. Build your own. And agencies are also, and they should be because they need to be extremely protective of cash flow. Mm -hmm. Anything they can do in house, they're going to do, even if it's not as good, because they, they can feed yep. their staff with it. They're not there to feed your staff. Yeah. I mean, that's another thing that we do at MindC is I've got. Uh, reports and metrics <laughs> more than I want, but like we know fully loaded cost of absolutely everybody. You know, we know what it goes in. We measure profitability based on who works on the projects. You know, like we really keep a close eye on it because cash, like your margin is all you've got, right? Yeah. We're trading a dollar for a dollar something, right? Like you're yeah. not, <laughs> we're trading, like we, we agencies sell time. People right? think that like, oh, that app project cost, uh, 50,000, 100,000, a million, whatever the cost ends up being, it sounds like agencies are fucking rich. Mm -hmm. They're charging these huge, exorbitant mm -hmm. an app. Shouldn't that cost like 500 bucks or something? Right, exactly. And they don't realize that the margins are very, very narrow. Yeah, it's, uh, very, very thin margins, um, especially into compared to some other types of, of things, um, like, you know, more. Like I don't know, restaurant business, for example, which also have tight margins, but I think they're still bigger than agency margins. Um, Depending on how well they're run, like an agency. Sure, yeah. and I mean this is the thing. Like the idea is to try and, you know, I've actually been doing some research trying to figure out what are the best sort of key key performance indicators I should be keeping an eye on in the in in our business. Mm. And I've always kept an eye on you know uh, several of them, right? Like of course, projects over or under budget, you know. Um, top line revenue, bottom line revenue, like, you know, EBITDA, what, like all of these types mm. of things, trying to figure out which ones I should be monitoring. The ever-elusive EBITDA. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> if, if people don't know, I you know, I I was in the agency game for many years until I knew what EBITDA was or even heard of it. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if all the listeners have heard of EBITDA. Really? It's kind of an uh, it's kind of an old school accounting term, isn't it? Yeah, I guess that's probably true. I probably didn't really learn about it uh until I started dealing with some larger companies, I guess. Earnings before interest. Is it dividends? No, no. Uh, it's Earnings taxes. Earnings before interest. Taxes and amortization. S and depreciation. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Something like that. So Look yeah, it up. I don't even know what it means. But I don't it's know what a, it means in my head. <laughs> but I remember talking to like this really um, seasoned business owner. He had like three businesses on the go, 100 person agency. And he, he was the one who taught me about EBITDA. He was looking at like buying our agency a mm -hmm, long time mm -hmm. ago. And he was like, it's That's all about, he was like, he sounded like Cheech from Cheech and Chong. He was like, it's all about the EBITDA, man. And, that's, and then we smoked a joint. <laughs> that's exactly, that's exactly, that's exactly how I found out about it as well. Really? Yeah. It was a potential uh, suitor. Really? Yeah. Maybe it was the same guy. No, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, so I, I think um, like those metrics, like trying to keep an eye on those things, is really important for an agency, right? Like you've got you've got nothing else. You've got people. Like I always say, my job as CEO of Mindsee is to um, acquire and retain the best talent. Mm. Like because that's our core product, right? Is yeah. the people that work there, and you know that's not slowly shifting, but I I don't give a lot of I didn't give a lot of uh, time to the other piece that is actually our core product, which is how we work. Mm. And I think that's a lot of agencies. Like the more you can get your processes down and, you know, project work by its nature is different than product work. Yes. Right? A project has a begin and an end and you're, tr- you're trying to solve a specific problem and you're usually starting from zero. Mm. Right. With a product, you're starting from zero once and then you're iterating on your product. So both very hard, um, but project work lends itself more to like, you need to morph into whatever situation the client puts you in, mm-hmm. right? It's like, oh, well, we've got some technical folks here that have done a bunch of work on this already, and we've, this is the way we want to go. And you know, maybe there's different technologies or different, um, different ways of doing it, or even different platforms that we have to deal with, right? Mm-hmm. So having a system to deal with all of that is, really cuts down on the, the FUD, like yeah. the, the churn and the crap that goes into each project. So if you've got like a good kickoff process and a good, you know, like a good communications plan that you can apply to every single project. So if you can get all those systems down, and maybe, I mean, maybe you had this experience at Headspace, I don't know, but mm. for us, it's been a, a lifesaver, right? Like we can, like I know when we kick off a project, what that means, Yeah. right? And everybody knows what it means. There's we wrote a standard it down. Yeah, we form, wrote, really, in a way. Yeah. Checklists, man, Trello checklists. But, but. Let me let me add this as I pour, <laughs> pour yourself another do you drink. Want, do you want another one? I'm feeling pretty warm. Are you feeling warm? I'm good. We could do this all afternoon now. Okay. I'm good. Well, we've got we've got about ten minutes left, but there's one yeah. thing I want to cover before we go. This is going to be a big drink. <laughs> I haven't. I'm like two weeks. I haven't had a drop. Yeah. Okay. Don't judge me, listeners. <laughs> Look at this one. Oh my gosh! For those who don't know, there's basically a red solo cup half full of gin over here. <laughs> There's also some vermouth. And it is actually a solo <laughs> cup. It just happens to be a clear solo <laughs> cup. Now, uh, I needed a big drink for this question because it takes me back to some dark days. Is this going to be <coughs> the, the one where we talk about our trip to San Francisco? Did we go to San Francisco? Don't you remember? No. <laughs> wow, we watched romantic comedies in we the did. hotel room we held hands. the whole time. That's awesome. No, the question is about um, charging for work. So. Yeah. This is, you asked about what our process was at Headspace, and I remember I put I always put a lot of thought into our process for mostly like large web builds. Yeah. We didn't really do a lot of apps, but like you know, like web-based software or whatever. Um, and we actually had a pretty good upfront process. Like we had we had a good discovery. We always sold like this mandatory. We sold it for five grand at the time. It was mm-hmm. like a UX discovery process where we really sit down with the client and figure out what they want to build and kind of do up the wireframes and really like narrow down the scope. And then from there, we say, okay, you can either take this whole plan, you can go shop it around to other agencies or you can give it to us, whatever. You can put it in an RFP. Mm-hmm. Um, and people like that. But the problem was we always took that scope that we helped them build and said, it'll cost this much. And then we they'd give us the project and then we would do it and then everything would just, it's like how they say like the universe just sort of naturally gravitates to chaos. Like mm-hmm. eventually all the systems break down and the universe implodes. It's a, that was what every project was, is it starts with this great idea and process and there's like the glory era of the project and then it just devolves into chaos. And at the end you're like, we didn't get content and the client says there's bugs and we missed the launch date because of the client and we don't even know where we're at in the billing process and you just lost money. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I never figured out how to like keep it on the rails. Yep. How do you do it? It's tough and we've gone through several painful lessons. Um, I can remember the very first app we sold, I think was for $12,000. Yeah, which is hilarious. I think we did one for five. You know, I did one for five once. Yeah. Um, and never again. Um, but we did one for 12 grand. Mm-hmm. And that app probably today would probably cost 80, 100 grand yeah. easily, maybe even more. Um, and at the time, we even lost our shirt on it. 
um, we had a great client. He understood that we put in a lot of extra effort into it and the scope changed and all that kind of stuff. And so he helped us out, but still didn't, you know, it was still good. Um, great relationship, work with, still work with them to this day. Mm. Um, and, but the things that have helped us and they're still not perfect, obviously. So if you're in, if you're in fixed price, fixed scope land, you're in pain, right? Yes. Like you just are. So like you. Nothing in life is fixed. Right. So what we would do, so we were even worse. We would start with the phone call and maybe another phone call and get like a list of requirements and then give a price. Oh. Right? So I don't know how many people who are listening can, are nodding their heads right now. Yeah. But I think this is probably a thing everybody's done. And we did this for a while. And it wasn't really until a few years ago that, because we kept talking about the discovery process. Hmm. And lots of agencies were doing it. You know, I saw myself as a development shop, not an agency. Like, you know, I just didn't think about things the same way. Yeah. And we would bring it up in sales conversations with clients. And I was doing the selling at the time, so you can imagine how that went. It's like, hey, this really cool discovery process. We can figure out what we should build before we build it. Blah, 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 blah. What do you think? No. Okay, you're, you're right. Terrible Just idea. tell me how much it is. You're, you're right. You're terrible. It's a terrible idea. Let's not do that. Let's yeah. just, we'll just quote you this thing. So we think, and then what you do, so this is what I would do. I would quote the project. I would come up with an estimate. I would look at it like, oh, man. Like, we'd break it down as best we could. We'd estimate it out line by line. Um, and my technical lead at the time, and I would look at it, and I would just rationalize myself out of work. I would rationalize myself down on the price. I'm like, oh, they're never going to go for that. That's just – and even in my own mind, I couldn't fathom how much. Why is it costing so much, yeah. you know? It would come out to be like $85,000 or something. I'm like, there's just no way. And we'd sell it for sixty yeah. or fifty. You know, something stupid like that. So those were the early days. Um, you'd, you'd sell it for what you think the client will pay, well, not how much it actually. Right. And you can do that when it's just you. Yeah. Like if you want to do that, like go for it. But you need to be a freelancer. Yeah. Because if it's your if it's just your time, who cares? Yeah. Nobody like it doesn't matter. You can you can pay your bills on. But if you're paying if you're whatever. paying salaries, <clears throat> like if you're paying high end developer salaries, designer salaries, you've got to make sure things work. Yeah. You know, there's a great article I read called "Double Is Nothing," which is about you know. If you someone if you say you pay someone fifty thousand dollars a year, what's that twenty five bucks an hour or something? Mm. And so therefore, oh yeah, sure, I'll build them out at fifty dollars an hour. No. You're not making any money. Right? Even a hundred is difficult because they're not billable every hour they right. work. Right, this is it. Right? right. So, so then we started doing our app blueprint process, which is a lot like your discovery phase. And yeah. I'm honestly not pitching. I'm just saying that's what we do. So app blueprint process oh, is exactly that. It was this idea of it's a it's a day long workshop to get to the core goals and you know, what the thing should be. We do some really cool low fidelity exercises. It's a lot like um, one of the Google Ventures design sprints, um, but not five days. Mm. Like it's one day of workshop and then we spend the next two or three weeks working together with the client to come up with, like we do wireframes, you know, we do visual designs and, you know, we try and get, and we do prototypes for user testing and we try and get user feedback and, you know, all those types of things. So we do this smaller engagement uh, up front. And then we'd estimate the work. And we'd estimate it in a similar way. We do a triple estimate for development. So hmm. basically, you know, the expected estimate, the worst case and the best case, right? Just to get Do you ask the developers how long something will take? Absolutely. Sure. Do they ever give you the right answer? Well, if you do I mean, it's just about trying to get the right it's it's really about if you do the triple estimate correctly, um, and maybe I'm not doing it correctly, but it's about finding risk. Hmm. So if someone comes along and says Best case, it's a day. Worst case, it's two days. You're probably okay, yeah. right? But if someone comes along and says, best case is five days, uh, worst case is 25 days, there's clearly a big piece of risk there. Yeah. Like, what well, is Because sometimes is they've risk? just never built it before. Well, this is it. They're just like, I don't know. They I don't, could get in I don't there. I don't even know. Yeah. And, and there's like, oh, shit. There's right. a whole sea of shit that I've never right. thought about and before. And it happens all the time. Yeah. So we do the triple estimate, and then we put together the, the project pricing and the whole works and we add some buffers and all the things they say you shouldn't do. Mm. Um, That's but, what account managers love. Okay, I got a proposal to write. It's due this yeah. afternoon. How long is this going to take? I'll pad it by 20%. I know, right. And then you lose money. Yeah, so I've built a set of spreadsheets. Surprising, surprise. Mm -hmm. um, a set of spreadsheets that take all this and do number crunching and you can, and it does cost analysis and based on fully loaded costs and the whole works and shows you what your margin should be, best case scenario, worst case scenario, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um but all, it's all designed just to give you some comfort. At the end of the day, you put a number on a proposal and you send it to a client and hope they sign it. And if they sign it, you're kind of stuck with it. So yeah. we've been doing a lot of other things now where we, you know, we build a lot of trust with our clients in that blueprint process. 
so we did a lot of agile development stuff. So recently what we've been doing is, you know, once we build that trust with the clients, we can say, okay, we're going to do this next. Like we're doing one right now that's uh, probably like an eight month project. So I'm sorry, requirements are going to change in eight months. Yeah. Like they're just going to change. So we've set it up so that we're going to, you know, we've got a dedicated team to the project and we're going to build by the sprint. Like it's just sprint. Yeah. Love that word. Yeah. I mean like, and we kind of run the company that way anyway. Like we do week long sprints, which is really short. That uh, is a short sprint. Yeah. But it keeps the cadence up and the projects themselves can be really short, like two to three months. Mm. So if you have a two week sprint, you don't really have a time to make adjustments. Right? No. So at the end of the week when you do your retrospective and you're talking to your team and the team is like, oh, this didn't work and this guy didn't do the thing and, you know, the client changed their mind 10 times and we let them, mm. you know, well, like we can make adjustments more quickly if we're doing uh, quicker sprints. It also keeps the level of urgency fairly high. Yeah. So the first week of a two-week sprint, it's like, oh, yeah, no, everything's great. And then the last week is kind of like a sprint towards the finish. Yeah. Um, which is why they call them sprints, I guess. But the idea is to sprint like the idea is to keep the level of urgency up through the whole process so that you hit your goal, right? Yeah. And so we've been running a project right now that's been going so, like amazingly well. The client's fantastic. It's a startup out of Toronto. We're really like everybody's just gelling. It's a and startup outsourcing their app build. Yeah, absolutely. Because they do they have a core and that might be too much information, but do they have a core product and is the app a part of it? No, or is their, that like their product? Their app is, is the product. They need to wow. get out you know, MVP time, wow, right? wow. they need to get it out. So they built a thing. They have, you know, their CTO is fantastic. He's built uh, a version of this and they've been able to use it to an extent, but to get something out for V1, we're, we're their team that's pushing it for them. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's really great. That must be fun work. It's excellent. It's so much yeah. fun working on startups. We have, uh, like we have a lot of, and the nice thing about working with a team like, like any team out of an agency is that they do get exposed to a lot of things over and over and over again. So they don't get the tunnel vision, right? They're working on lots of different projects all the time. So yeah. if we can bring all that experience to bear, it's really fun. So um, where was I going with this? Well, there's one thing that I just wanted to, to mention, which is that one, th and you probably deal with it all the time, is clients have this idea of a project being finished. Mm -hmm. Software is never finished. Uh -huh. There's no such thing. It's I, I compared it recently in a blog post to being nourished. Mm -hmm. It's like you're only one meal away. Yep. From being nourished. And until you're dead, <laughs> until you're like buried, you are never nourished. Yeah, one meal or one large martini. Exactly. A sprint is a meal. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, if I was to do it again, and I might be totally wrong and I might never be able to sell a client on the idea because they like, no, just tell me the number. How much is this going to cost? Yeah, that still happens. I would be like, I'm selling you two, three weeks. Mm -hmm. You can only buy three week meals. There's no such thing as done. Yeah. The project is like you can buy three sprints or you can buy ten sprints, but there's no such thing as the project being finished. Right. So here's the problem with, with that and, and something I've grappled with over the years is that it's about balancing risk, right? So when a client comes to you and they want a number, they want to know how much they're going to pay because they don't want to pay for something and not get what they want. Yeah. Right? And as an agency, we don't want to overextend ourselves just to give them what they want and therefore we don't get what we need. It's got to be give and take, right? Mm -hmm. So I've somebody famous probably said like a good deal is where both of you feel a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. Right? Both of you had to compromise a little bit. Yeah, you had to you have to you have to trust in each other a little bit. So mutual respect and trust is paramount. So building that relationship from the beginning also why you shouldn't work with partners. <laughs> um, being able to build that relationship yourself. They want it all. Well, they, yeah, they want it all. I mean, but building that relationship yourself is really uh, important. Mm. Um, but we did this we, we did, <laughs> years ago when it was just me and, a, and another developer friend um, working on projects. We did, um, we had a project that had been burned by IT companies before. And they were, re they're in Calgary and they were really <laughs> worried about working with a remote partner again and yeah. we were a small shop. And I said, okay, no problem. I said, we'll work for a week. It might have been two weeks back then. So we'll do two weeks worth of work. And this is before you could even do over the air distribution for apps. So we had no way of really getting them a copy of the app without having their physical device connected to iTunes back mm. in those days. Um, so we would do a video. So like we'd fire up ScreenFlow and we would, you know, use the simulator and we would record us and a talking head in the corner and talk, to, talk them through all the features we added to the app that week. Mm. And I would send them the video and an invoice. Mm. 
and they would go over it and they would say, yeah, that looks good. Thank you. You know, uh, that's great. And they would release payment for that week. Wow. So we were doing, and it was a larger project. So but we, this is the challenge. We still had to give them that big ballpark. Yeah. We still had to give them something that they could hold on to, that they could take back to their decision makers. Right. Because if you come to a company cold and say, absolutely, we'll build this for you, two week increments, 20 grand a week, 20 grand every two weeks. Hmm. Right. They're just going to go, really? I, I don't, what am I getting out of this? Like, they're not going to know. They got to build that trust. Right. right? You, your clients look at it as a destination. Take me to this place. Yes. The agency is like, we're going on a journey and mm -hmm. we might end up here or we might end up there. It right. really depends on a lot of things. And it's like, how do you convince right. them that we're going on a journey together? We're not saying we're taking you, yeah. you know, so, 30 miles that way. Right. So some really good things to do that, small projects to begin with. Hmm. Right. So like your discovery phase, our blueprint phase, every agency has some form of this super critical because you yeah. get to figure out if you can work with them, if they can work with you, if they're going to be a good client. It's a know. foot in the door project. But, too, yeah, right? but it is, but it's even more than it's just about building that trust. But that's what I mean. The foot in the door project is you're still getting paid. You're not doing free. Yeah. You know, don't do scoping. spec work. Yeah. Never do spec work. Yeah, everybody. exactly. You probably heard it on this podcast several times, but don't we might do, have brought don't, it up before. Don't, don't do spec work. But then you might discover as you're doing the foot in the door project that you don't want to work with them, which mm -hmm. is great. Part yep. ways you made money. Yep. They got something out of it. Sure. But if you do want to work together, then you're more likely to win the big project by doing that early project. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, we, and this is what we do. So we, we are, we operate our blueprint very similar to yours. Like we do this full design and our guarantee to them is they'll have everything they need to go off and build their app with somebody else. Mm. So, and as part of the delivery, which is facetious because we know they're going to come to you. No, we built up the trust with you. We've actually had people come to us saying, look, we just need the blueprint. Really? Yeah. yeah, the blue. I mean, and the thing is, like our blueprint, like super valuable, right? Because it can be used to help fund. It can get you pre-funding. It can get you because mm. you know we build some really beautiful things. There's a pitch deck that goes with it. Yeah, like there's some really great stuff that you can use as uh, tools to help you in your path to getting, you know, whatever round of funding you're in, right? But yeah, no, I think uh, what were we? This is really good, Jin. We it is good gin, right? It's Bombay Sapphire. It's got herbs in it. Anyway, you know what? Uh, Bill, you have a meeting to go to. You're let's, checking your watch. Let's keep going. What? Yeah, we can go for another another 15 minutes. <laughs> okay. I, I'm having a lot of fun. Good. Yeah. I'm having fun too. And, and I I'm having a hard said, time. I am I'm going to say I'm having a hard time hearing my voice through my headphones. Really? No, I'm not having a hard time. I just can't get over how good it sounds. It I'm sounds just saying, so good, right? <laughs> anyway, um, I ha am having a lot of fun. Yeah. I always said you would be a great guest. Yeah, I want to do more. Let's, I want to do more let's too. Keep talking. So um, you were on this cold call. So I'm on this cold call, and we just we're going through this exercise, and I'm challenging, I'm challenging. Anyway, I didn't think we were going to get anything out of it, right? Um, we left it in. You know, I really think the blueprint can help you out here and figure out if this is the right thing to build. And uh, sure enough, they decided they wanted to work with. He's he's in California. There was someone else in Canada. California. You know, and it was just, yes. I can't make, I, I can't hear California. Cauliflower. <laughs> cauliflower. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's I'm okay. sorry, people. I've had a lot of gin. So anyway. you in um, California. Anyway, so we, did the, so we did this blueprint, right? And this mm. is the thing. Um, so we got the business because we asked those questions, right? He could have easily worked with anybody else. That was just like, yeah, yeah, cool. Thanks for the spec. We'll build you the app you want. Good luck, pal. In the app store, you're never going to make it, right? <laughs> Good luck, like take pal. take the money and run. Right. Yeah. And we don't want to do that. Well, I want to make sure that the apps we're going to build are going to be good. And that's really hard sometimes. Mm. Even sometimes big clients don't want to maintain their stuff. Oh yeah. Right. Well, the difficult thing is like there's as an agency owner, you need to make money. Mm -hmm. You also need to believe in what you're doing. Because if your team's not motivated, if, they're, if they don't love what they're doing, they're not going to be happy. Oh, absolutely. You're not going to be proud to show it off. You're not going to use them as a case study, right? So there's a fine line between we got to make money. we got to bring yes. money in. But we also need to like what we're doing and be happy and motivated and passionate. And the difficult thing is like telling a client, that's the dumbest idea <laughs> I've ever heard. <laughs> right. Especially you're when, an idiot. Especially when they're waving a check at you. I know. Where, yeah. where do you draw the line? Uh, I've got some rules. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I've broken some rules over time, too. I never wanted to do dating apps before. And I think in our conversation <laughs> just before this, I told you about two different dating apps that we 
we're looking at doing. You join Grinder. Yeah. <laughs> you're looking act. You're actively looking for uh, a hookup with a man. Yes, that's what the, you told the, that's, me. That's correct. Thanks, Kyle. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Well, no, what's like, your handle, Bill Wilson? Is there a way to contact <laughs> you through Grinder? Thanks. Um, no, we, we had people. So there's a couple things like gambling, you know, at the time dating sites. But I've realized that there's actually some really great stuff happening in the dating world that's not sleazy. Mm. Um, and maybe I'm just passing my own judgment, my own beliefs through. Like I, I just didn't want to work. I did a gig at ALC, Atlantic Lotto Corporation. Oh. And I said, cool, as long as I don't have to see any video lottery terminals, I sort of broke my own rules. <laughs> and they sat me in the warehouse full of video lottery terminals. Did you get to see, like, old, like, fishermen just... <laughs> <laughs> it was terrible. It's where, they, it's where they fixed them. Anyway, I just didn't... Yeah, it wasn't for me. You get to see people ruining their but, yeah, lives. Like, Did they sit in front of those people? Well, so the thing... So how do you... So your question was, how do we handle the situation where you know, we don't want to do their app. Yeah, like I had a, I had a, a client that had space who came to me. He's like, I want to build an app that like sorts your email into junk yeah, exactly. and spam. I was like, that's stupid. Gmail does that. Just right. So what I've realized is that sometimes those ideas on the surface sound ridiculous until you dig into them. So I always try and just dig in more and understand. But something like we had somebody who wanted to do they wanted to do phone call recording. So they're like, yeah, yeah, no. So we'll just build something that embeds into the iPhone phone app. And then it'll record your phone calls. That's useful, actually. Sure, but you can't, like, what? You can't, like, technically, you just can't do anything oh. to Apple's existing phone apps, right? Mm. So if you wanted to build your own phone, then you've got this thing about penetration. You've got to get into them. You've got to pe get people using your your digital handset, you know? And there's lots of people that want to build VoIP software, right? Yeah. And there's lots of VoIP. So anyway, so you go, you, you go through all these <laughs> cauliflower. You go through all California. The, you go through all of these. VoIP. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this Sorry. is getting out of hand. All right. So you go through all these situations where, you know, sometimes the idea is just not good. And sometimes you just say, you know, we're probably not the right fit for you. Right? Like you just have to be – and I think it's really important to, to not dance around it. Like you just say, like, respectfully, we're going to pass on your project. It's probably not the right fit for our team. So, for example, if someone wants to use – someone calls us up and says, we're going to build an app. We're going to do all the design, testing, project management. We just need a developer. I'm oh, like, go fuck not, yourself. I'm like, we're just not your team. Right. Yeah. There are lots of people out there that do body shopping. We're not it. Mm -hmm. Right. We've got a process about how we build apps and it includes designers working in Xcode. The designers work in Xcode. They work alongside the developers. They make iterations and like they're constantly iterating on the on the work mm. together. We've got our QA is embedded into that system and so is our project management. So we have a team doing all that work. Um, and sometimes you just have to draw the line and say, no, no, like it doesn't make any sense for the opportunity cost of having, so I don't know about other agencies, but for us doing software development, it's kind of worked out to a ratio of roughly 30% of your time is spent on design, 60% is spent on development, and 10% is spent on QA. It's just sort of how it's, mm. like just, that's a historical view of a lot of our projects. Yeah. So say you had a developer that was going to now go body shop. So that's 60% of a project gone. Right, mm. like that person could be working on a full project with a designer and a tester and a project manager. Yeah. Right. And, and now, suddenly you can't be responsible for the whole right. thing. This is it. So you're like, we didn't do the design. So we some, didn't test it. So sometimes doing that isn't the best thing. So it also manifests itself when you work with clients that have their own internal dev teams. Mm. Um, but I, I've, I've had great. We've had good success with this. Like you can come alongside, and be that extra horsepower they need, as long as you've got the right chunk of work that you can manage the way you need to manage and deliver, you know, deliver the way you need to. Sometimes there's more stress and strain between the two development teams of figuring out architecture because mm. everybody wants to have their thumbprint on it. Yeah. Um, but generally you can, you can get through it. But when someone calls up and they just want a body shop, we don't do it. Now, I'm not going to say there's not exceptions. If an existing client calls up and says, hey, you know that app we built, I need someone to fix blah, blah, blah. That's different. You've you built it. Yeah. It's not like somebody else built this shit. Now you fix it. Well, we get that. Yeah, that's those are some of our but favorites. That, but you want to rebuild it. You don't <laughs> yeah. want to fix it. Yeah. Sometimes we get the uh, sometimes the foot in the door for us has been uh, clients let app rot, old app team disappeared or was from some offshore place that was never going to get back to them anyway, and they engage us to do a quality pass because iOS seven came out or whatever iOS nine came out and a bunch of stuff broke. Yeah. So we'll do a QA pass, fix a bunch of defects, do a small do a small release, 
and then that's our foot in the door for continuing to maintain and, and build out the product. Yeah, you've got a you've that. got a client call. You've you've yeah, actually got work to do. So I'm getting drunker and drunker by the yeah, second. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And you. I want to pick this up. I want to. Let, let's let, do it. Let's pick it up. I've always. I'm going to finish my call, and we're going to keep going. This is going to be an eight-hour episode. It's okay. You, you're going to have fun. At, I'm sorry, Kevin, for the editing nightmare. Yeah, Kevin's down in Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> You're going to edit this, right? Have Probably. Uh, have a good call. Thanks, man. We'll pick it up. And... Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't actually... I, it's, things sort of trailed off from there. Um, so I, Sorry, I know. That was a little anticlimactic. Um, not a proper ending. So, um, yeah, I guess that interview just sort of started to fall off the rail. So probably good we ended it when it did. Um, the drinks were very strong. I had an empty stomach. I was sick. I haven't, you know, didn't drink in weeks. So it was a bit of a rough afternoon. I'm not going to lie. Um, this is why I usually try not to actually drink on the podcast. Um, I think I'm going to stick to um, not as hard drinks next time. Anyway, hopefully you got some value out of that. Um, as always, let it, let us know what you think, um, what topics we should cover, any questions you have on running an agency or, or, uh, building a profitable business, um, you know, either myself or Kevin uh, or our guest are always happy to answer those questions for you. I uh, would love it if you rated and reviewed us on the iTunes store. And if you want to be a guest on Agencies Drinking Beer, just shoot us over an email, uh, which you can find on our site. Um, that, uh, that's everything. I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this episode, and, uh, and we'll see you next week.